Welcome to What's Treading with Tire Review. I'm Maddie Weiner, and today on the podcast, we're joined by Steve Rathbone, Managing Director within the Investment Banking Group at global advisory firm Stout, and Philip Kane, Senior Advisor for Stout. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you Thanks for having us. Well, thank you. So I, I know we're going to be talking about um, sort of M&A in the tire industry in this podcast. So I wanted to start out with some of the biggest news in the first half of this year, um, Goodyear's acquisition of Cooper Tire. Um, so I, I wanted to know, how do you both feel this investment will affect the industry and, and market share among tire manufacturers in, the, in North America? Uh, thanks, Madeline. It's a, it's a question um, and a topic that Philip and I have contemplated and, and a lot of people in the industry uh, continue to think about. Uh, we certainly see it that that scale in manufacturing matters and, and the enhanced scale of the combined Goodyear and Cooper companies should over time uh, be a factor which enhances the competitive position of the combined companies. Uh, in regards to market share, uh, we don't see reason for immediate market share gains against the tier one players. Uh, as the, the transaction does not so much speak to, to taking share gains uh, against uh, these particular manufacturers in the tier one. We do, however, see enhancing product offerings, uh, obtaining R&D production and distribution synergies, and perhaps taking share in the tier two and OE channels. Madeline, we also see a potential silver lining here in, in that this acquisition could give Goodyear an opportunity to rethink their overall distribution strategy, particularly in wholesale. So, so for this acquisition, um, I know I've been hearing different things from dealers about it, but how do, you, how do you both see this impacting the tire dealer channel, independent tire dealers, you know, down the line as, as these two companies uh, sort of integrate and, um, you know, merge, merge and, and form synergies, like you said, Steve? Well, we feel Goodyear exercises um, some caution as to the distribution of Cooper product. Um, independent tire dealers are closely watching how Goodyear plans to use Cooper in alternative channels. As a matter of, of risk mitigation, dealers are keeping their powder dry with regard to other manufacturer relationships. Got it. And what do you mean by that? Dealers, um, you know, are dealers just trying to like play, play it safe with, with their other other manufacturers and, and give them equal business? Or can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, and I'll, I'll ask Philip to chime in. It's, um, it, it's really uh, given the uncertainty of, of what may happen in the independent channel. And, and we see it, dealers uh, taking risk mitigation techniques in, in keeping their options somewhat open as to, to how they do business with manufacturers going forward. Philip. Yeah. Mantle, I think Steve's spot on in this. I think, as you know, Madeline, Cooper has been a brand for the independent tire dealer forever. And I think dealers are, are cautiously watching to see what's going to happen with Cooper moving forward. And if, if Cooper were to be more widely distributed, creating competitive pressures on the independent tire dealer, uh, dealers are, are certainly going to be open to advances from other brands in their business. So uh, for us, that's we're watching this development the same way. Um, now, I wanted to kind of shift into a, I guess, larger view of the industry. And um, I, I'm curious as, as to what you both think. How do you, how do you think the pandemic has impacted M&A activity in the tire industry? And um, I was wondering if you could share maybe any transaction stats that point to any particular trends you've been seeing. Sure. Um, well, consolidation clearly remains a, a key theme, especially among manufacturers and, and retailers in, in recent time. Uh, Monroe, Les Schwab, Mavis, uh, or the large players, they, they've all been active in M&A. Uh, we've seen Bridgestone actively greenfielding its retail expansion. Uh, aside from Goodyear and Cooper, we, we do know of another fairly meaningful and significant manufacturer that, that is in market right now and that we expect that deal to take place later in the year. Uh, when it comes to addressing wholesale, it's been fairly slow uh, in regards to M&A activity in the last few years, but we do feel there is real potential and opportunity for renewed consolidation, which will be led by the large and mid-sized regional independents, most likely with private equity backing. 
We also see significant opportunity in the, in the commercial sector for M&A activity and uh, private equity involvement. Very interesting. So a, a lot of this private equity backed um, and, and we've seen that pre-pandemic as well. Um, so, you, so you're saying you feel that, uh, you know, down the line, uh, more consolidation uh, between large, large players and uh, sort of mid-sized regional players in the distribution sector will will be taking place because we haven't seen that much, I, at least it, from my view this year. Yeah, and wholesale has been a little quiet for the last few years. Uh, retail, we have seen some fairly significant action with Les Schwab at the end of 2020 and, uh, and Mavis changing hands earlier this year. Uh, we also have uh, Monroe, um, Les Schwab and others uh, picking up uh, smaller and mid-sized networks around the country in the, in the retail sector. But in wholesale, you're, you're right. It's it's been a fa fairly slow activity outside of a few acquisitions here and there. We do see that, however, as a, a pretty significant opportunity going forward. We strongly believe that there will be another uh, wholesale consolidation, uh, if not um, ultra regionally, then then possibly nationally at some point in time. Uh, different independent tire dealers. Are you seeing any trends in terms of geographic activity and and where where uh, these acquisitions are taking place by chance? Yeah, and feel, feel, feel free to jump in. It, it seems that some of the larger players uh, in the East, like like Monroe and Mavis, have, have made it a point to, to travel West and, and South. Uh, you already have Les Schwab out there that will move further East and, 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 and increase its footprint uh, coming in this direction. Yeah, I think Steve's dead on in, in his analysis. So you have Mavis and Monroe that were centralized primarily uh, in the east, moving west, they'll continue that activity. They've already started their uh, kind of western base, moving back toward the east. GB Auto, um, headquartered primarily in the southwest, will fan out from there. Les Schwab um, recently started their activity with their acquisition of planes, uh, so they'll, they'll fan out from the west. So I think the, the best advice there is to look where these, these folks are centralized and then watch their activity. Uh, we think another group to watch will be Tire Discounters headquartered in Cincinnati, um, a privately held group, but, but they're on the move um, and they'll continue to, to grow outward from, from their base of operations uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio. You know, it seems like, like and, and you have said too, like retail acquisition, uh, retail consolidation, excuse me, has really, really picked up since you know, uh, we're kind of entering into a post-pandemic world. What do you think are some of the factors that have sort of led to that? And, and well, I guess first off, it seems to me you feel like that is true, correct? Correct, <laughs> no question. Okay. Got it. So yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see what, what your thoughts are on some of the market factors that have sort of led up to this and are influencing the rate of consolidation currently. Yeah. Um... Consolidation has been very strong in retail for, for years. Um, it's not a new trend, but it's a trend that, that is persistent and, and probably increasing. With the, the big players in retail now pretty much all in the hands of the institutional investors, uh, you take Mavis, Les Schwab, even, even Pep Boys, uh, we expect to see more large deals here as, as retailers uh, vie for turf market share and purchasing and, and cost synergies. Uh, the independent retail channel is still a very significant part of the market. It, it remains strong. Uh, it provides a, uh, a high value service offering to customers, both when it comes to, to range of products um, purchased through the independent network, uh, as well as the services provided, especially install. Uh, we, we believe that, you know, when you look at value um, of the independent retail network at present, the values of these companies um, have probably never been higher uh, than they are at present. And there have never been more large acquirers competing for expansion opportunities than there is right now. Um, this is more especially the case given the involvement of institutional investors and in their mandate for outsized growth given they are financially supporting these large legacy retailers like the, the Mavises and the Les Schwabs, um, they're very much just acting like pure strategic buyers and, and valuing companies accordingly. Steve, you're saying, you know, 
obviously with these bigger companies um, that are in the retail landscape, private equity, excuse me, private equity backed, they have the money to go in and, and acquire these companies. It, it, are you saying that, you know, independent retailers are, their businesses are more valuable now than maybe ever yes. before? Yeah, okay. so, so not only do they have the money, they have the ambition and the motivation, as well as the directive from their investors to grow. And and we think this is a, a very good sign for independent retailers. How do you feel, you know, looking out the next half of this year, um, how, how do you feel the M&A uh, environments in in right now, I guess, both distribution and retail will will sort of pan out this year. Um, it seems like, you know, more acquisitions will be coming down the line, but um, what, what's your take on that? Philip, you wanna, you wanna lead off? Sure. We continue to see a, a robust market for M&A moving forward as, as the year continues to unfold. There's, there's certainly money um, out there to be put to good use in investment. And so we continue to see a, a, a nice market for M&A moving forward. Yep, I, I, I concur. There, there are excellent conditions in place for M&A and we think that's across, pretty much across the industry. And uh, while we're, we're seeing a, a slight lull um, in, in this particular industry right now in M&A, that's going to change. It's going to pick up again as, uh, as things shake themselves out this year. It, it may be that people and com <clears throat> companies are dealing with more immediate issues around uh, supply. Um, that that is definitely a, um, a, a sore tooth in the industry right now. But um, but the conditions for M and A are, are not going away. We think that's going to be uh, very ripe, um, and and will probably expand out again from uh, from retail and manufacturing into into wholesale and commercial at a point. Well, I have one more question for you, gentlemen. Um, I was curious if you could go over the role uh, e-commerce has been playing in, in the tire industry, um, you know, throughout the pandemic up to, to now, to recently. Um, you know, it, it should, should independent tire dealers be worried about, you know, rising, uh, the rising use of e-commerce? Uh, good question. The, um, and, and very, very timely more and more consumers are using e-commerce as a way to, to research, price compare, and then purchase uh, tires as well as service such, such as installation. Uh, the pandemic has very much changed the way consumers behave in terms of how they purchase. Um, it's not so much driven by the shortages that we spoke before, um, but the pandemic definitely had a big impact in, in, in pushing um, consumers to the online channel. The, uh, we see this um, and we see the dominant players in the channel, such as a, a tire rack, for example, making significant market share gains and, and doing very well uh, based on, uh, on recent events. The, uh, I think notably this is, is very good also for independent retail dealers, given the need for installation and related services stemming from an online purchase. And if you've ever used the online tools um, and, and the, portals provided by some of the players and, and you've browsed the range, you've browsed uh, the products, the pricing, uh, there are excellent options to then go and schedule your appointments on installation and service, uh, which is really a seamless end-to-end -end, um, experience. And I think consumers are, are really picking up on that um, and, uh, and running with it. You know, the, the gains made by this channel um, over the last sort of 16 months, um, and the gains we'll see going forward, I, I don't think they're given back uh, at all. If you know, certainly not easily. So I think these are very permanent shifts. Interesting. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to see what the rest of the year brings. But um, gentlemen, I want to thank you both for coming on the What's Treading with Tire Review podcast. I, I really appreciate your time, and and yeah, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you for having us.